So on to you, Joe. So you will be speaking at UX Live. Mm -hmm. And before we get to that, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. What? Hmm. Uh, who are you and um, what are you doing? <laughs> who are you? What are you doing here? Yes. <laughs> um, I, I am, you know, first and foremost, I'm a, I'm a UX consultant. I, I've been... Um, I've been working in design and UX for nearly three decades. This is my 29th year of doing this, which every time I say that out loud, it, it makes me feel very old. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's been a wild ride, right? Um, I went from, from doing a lot of tactical work, uh, of, of course. I worked for design firms and ad agencies. I started my own business in 1998. Uh, because I was either bold or dumb enough to decide I wanted to have my own experience design firm is what we called it at the time. What happened was I saw the work of Alan Cooper and, and my head exploded, right? And mm. I thought, okay, interaction, experience, like, and then of course I read Don Norman and all that stuff. Yeah. And, and it just took off from there. So um, I ran that company for about 10 years. I sold it, um, hung out for a few years trying to help the company that bought it establish UX, learned that they didn't want to. <laughs> went, went back to independent consulting and uh, I've been doing that ever since. And I spend my time um, speaking, obviously, um, writing and recording videos, doing online courses. I've got about 150,000 students at this point, wow. um, which makes me feel incredibly, incredibly fortunate. Um, and I, I'm lucky enough to have clients all over the world. So I'm a, I'm a very fortunate human being is the way I would describe myself. <laughs> Well, that's good. So you're traveling a lot. So you see a yeah. lot of uh, different teams and different companies and different cultures. Yes. And uh, yes. so how how does that vary? How does the UX culture vary, like country by country? Is that a thing, culture by culture? Or or how would you describe the differences if you travel um, quite a bit? I, I'll tell you what's interesting is is that I, there's actually more commonality than, than mm. difference. And a huge commonality is that, and it's the reason I do what I do, right? My, my consulting work has morphed into not only helping teams with end product UX issues, it's a lot about helping them navigate day-to-day -day challenges, right? Um, and a lot of that is internal, right? It's working mm -hmm. with stakeholders, it's working with right. other team members, it's working with executives, middle managers, project managers, product owners. Um, so the commonality is that, that everybody is struggling in a way that all this stuff that they've been trained to believe works, right? It looks great on paper. We read all these articles, we see videos, we read books, Right. We take courses and it all sounds great, right? There's this UX process, right? Lean, agile. Right. Um, people are talking about safe now, all sorts of things. And it looks and sounds great. And inside the walls of an organization, and I've found this everywhere I've gone, even in some of the biggest organizations in the world who we think have it all figured out, yeah. it does not work the way it works on paper. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there I are, actually there like are a lot that, of walls, a um, lot of obstacles. You have you have this uh you have this uh sentence that i read somewhere what works um in the messy reality is very different from uh, what works in in kind of these blog posts and stuff that people write online can you talk a bit about that like sure i mean how how do you help your students um or your audience in general to kind of navigate the messy reality and what's the difference maybe you, what's first what's the difference between the messy reality and what you um, reading all these best practices online and what you should do, um, yeah. Versus, yeah. Well, well the big difference, with. the big difference is human beings. Okay, mm. the minute you throw humans into the mix, we're messy, we're emotional, mm. right? We're motivated by all sorts of things. Every person in every position um, and, and every part of an organization is motivated by different things intrinsically, personally, politically. That's who we are. Okay, mm -hmm. if we have a bad morning. Right. If if my if I got a flat tire on the way to work, that colors my entire day. Right. So you can have all the great processes in the world, but the minute you throw five, 10, 20, 30, 40 in some cases, human beings into the mix, things get very messy very fast because we're we're idiosyncratic, we're unpredictable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. And and a lot of the things that that prevent products from being great. It's never because people don't have enough talent or enough ability or enough knowledge or enough skill. It's almost always because there are opposing ideas about what constitutes success. And some of those mm. are intensely personal, right? I talk about this a lot and I'm gonna talk about it uh, in London. A lot of these things come from fear, come from uncertainty, come from how is all that stuff you're proposing to do, all that, all that stuff on this chart you're showing me, this process, this customer journey process, right. whatever it is, 
How's it going to get me what I want? How's mm -hmm. it going to take this weight off my shoulders, right? That I'm carrying around with me 24 hours a day. Um, those are the things that show up. And, and again, that's messy. So the first thing I tell teams to do is number one, abandon all these things you think you're going to do. All right. Take a step back. Forget about step one phase or phase one, phase two, phase three. Forget about mm -hmm. what we're going to do in this sprint, next sprint. Just take a step back for a second. What's the wall you're running into and what's the cause of it? Because until you get to that, you can sprint plan until you are dead. Mm -hmm. Can you <laughs> make an example is, for us? Like what, nothing what, what, is what going to change. What would be a wall that people face often? Well, the first thing that came to mind, and I don't know if this is, this is a good answer to your question, but I talked to an organization, very large organizations about, this was maybe two months ago, okay? Mm -hmm. They're describing the fact that they're releasing every week. Okay. They're releasing every week and they feel like they're behind. They're perpetually behind. They can't catch up. Stakeholders are upset because all these promised features and functionality are not happening. And yet mm -hmm. they're releasing every week. I'm like, mm -hmm. okay, something really weird is going on here. Yeah. So I'm thinking about it. Right. And I said, out of curiosity, how much is in your backlog right now? They said 200 items. <laughs> I said, how often do items get added to that 200? They said, every week. Right. Okay, so what this tells me immediately is you're doing a lot of work, right? Everybody's overworked. They're working like 14-hour days. They're working on the wrong things. Mm -hmm. They're pushing out stuff every week that does not matter. Mm -hmm. Somewhere in that two, list of 200 things, number one, most of that is probably unimportant if it keeps getting shoved to the back. But number two, they're just doing work to do work. And people keep asking for stuff. So what I talk to them about is how they validate these decisions. And, and for them, it went back to user stories, which is something I've talked about a lot. And I said, well, you have to start validating this stuff and figure mm -hmm. out why it matters. If you can't connect, uh, you know, user needs to do this because it's going to help them in this way. And it's going to help us in this way. It's going to help the company. It's cost, you know, money made, money saved. Mm -hmm. If you can't attach that statement to anything on that list, it waits. Mm -hmm. period right now i don't care what else you're doing do that <laughs> yeah do you okay have so there's some, there's an example do you have some so if i got because i know i mean at least in, in in my experience and the teams i've seen this is a very common problem right this um, ever-growing backlog um mm -hmm. if i am faced with this situation today what can i do to actually prioritize what can I do? I mean, you said like, you know, attach user stories to it. Is yeah. there any other? So I am I am uh, sitting in front of Asana and I see this huge backlog. What what can I do, right? I think, and, and again, I don't think this is, um, I don't, it doesn't have to be a lengthy process. It's a lot about asking questions. Mm -hmm. It's about It's about figuring out whether those things, I'm gonna say this this way, deserve to live or not. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Are they worth doing? There's no possible way. I'm going to tell you right now, as long as I've been doing this, as many different types of projects, projects and products that I have seen, there is no way that a backlog that's beyond half a dozen items, there's no way it's all valid. I've never seen that be true one time mm -hmm. in 20 plus years, right? For as long as at least for, or for as long as agile has been a thing, let's say mm -hmm. I've never seen that be true ever. There's a lot of garbage. And then there's, there's anywhere from three to six things that are really tremendously important. So you have mm -hmm. to qualify them. You have to say to the powers that be, the people who are making that list, if it's not you, right. you have to say, why is this important? What does that get you? Mm -hmm. Notice I didn't say, what does that get the company? What does it get you? If mm -hmm. we do this in two weeks or if three weeks or four weeks or whatever it is and it launches, what does it get you? Mm -hmm. Or what, or what happens as a consequence of not doing it? Yeah. Those are the questions you have to ask because it, it makes that person nine times out of 10, even if they're sort of difficult to work with, here's what I've found. It makes them step back and think, okay, well, it's, okay, that really doesn't get me any closer to what I really need here. Mm. Self-interest trumps best practice every day of the week. And a lot of what winds up on these lists, these to-do lists yeah. and the asks and the requests and the orders that we get they're personally motivated. Okay. Mm -hmm. They're, they're not, they're not what we think they are. Yeah. And we take this as fact. Yeah. And all it takes a lot of times is just asking some questions in a very diplomatic, very polite way. 
you don't go say, well, this is, this is absolutely wrong and this is terrible UX and this is going to do this. And, and it goes against everything that we, you can't have that conversation. Right. You got to speak to, you got to ask that person why that's there in the first place and what they think it's going to gain them by doing it. So, okay. So, so the, oh, by the way, because I didn't mention it before, I'm asking questions now, but you can ask questions um, all the way through the, um, through our conversations. And there is a Q and a tab on the, on the top. And um, you can just ask your questions and we'll, we'll get to them in the Q and a part at the end. Um, so basically, prioritization um, respectively, like a large backlog is one issue that you're seeing. Are there others um, that come to mind that you see oftentimes that teams are struggling oh, sure. with? Sure. I mean, there's, there are any number of things. There's, there's the classic, you know, I, I need this yesterday. I'm going to give you this laundry list of work and it all has to be done by this date. There are instances where um, UXers and developers are at odds simply because they think they're at odds. Mm -hmm. You know, there's situations in Agile in particular, right? The, the, the running joke to me, and no one else thinks it's a joke, but I do, is this whole idea when, when integration with UX and Agile came about, this has been a thing for a long time in, in that designers or UXers have to be two weeks ahead of development. Mm -hmm. This is the most ridiculous thing mm -hmm ever proposed all right and i'm saying that out loud and i you know i don't care how anybody takes it it never works it does not mm -hmm. ever work it turns agile into waterfall somebody yeah. is waiting on either end for right. work so companies come to me all the time they say we're just we can't this integration is not working like nobody everybody's mad nobody likes each other nobody is is giving each other what they need and mm -hmm. we're slower as a result and what i say is if it's slow you're doing it wrong mm -hmm. <laughs> right Put those people to get, get, a, get a designer or UXer and a developer and put them side by side all day, every day. Mm. Okay, I read something a while ago by Brad Frost where he said, look, put everyone everywhere. Uh -huh. <laughs> and I thought that was the greatest thing I ever heard because it's, it's what I preach. Mm -hmm. Okay, forget all this. Again, it's, it's rigid attachment to process. It should be done this way. Based mm -hmm. on what? If it's not working, right. it obviously shouldn't be done that right. way. It's like pair programming. Pair programming is a great idea. It's a fantastic idea. Why aren't we doing the same thing with designer UX? Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and tackle smaller pieces mm -hmm. as well. That's the other thing. Take a small chunk, iterate the hell out of it really quickly and push it out. Yeah. In, at least in prototype form. I mean, so do you see, um, let's say the companies that are doing it well, what are some of the processes or I guess maybe the opposite of processes freedoms they give to their teams? Like what's, what, what are the differences yeah. actually? There's, there's a couple of parts of that. I mean, part of it is certainly autonomy. Okay. Mm -hmm. Where, where the, the promise of agile and lean and everything else, the idea mm -hmm. of self-organizing teams, right? Self-governing teams. When that happens, when product owners are playing the role of guiding right? And being there as a backstop and making sure mm -hmm. that everybody has what they need, but basically allowing the teams to make the decisions about what happens uh, and why, right? And being a check, of course, to validate those things from, from the business side. But autonomy is a big part of it, mm -hmm. right? You're letting people say, look, here's the reality that we live in. We're going to make these decisions based on this reality. Here's what we know we can get done. Here's what we think really matters most. Here's what we think we're going to gain from that. Mm -hmm. The minute somebody divorced from the process is making those decisions, you have trouble. So that's the first thing. The, the second thing is it's they obviously have a process that they follow, right? They obviously have procedures. They have tools that they use. There's nothing wrong with any of that. But they are also willing to abandon that path the minute it looks like it's not working. Mm. Okay. Mm -hmm. If this isn't happening, we've been doing this for four weeks and we're stuck repeatedly. Something has to change. What is it? Mm -hmm. Okay. I, um, I talked to a team a week and a half ago that abandoned stand-up meetings. Interesting. 20 people, which would, which, you know, ideally a stand-up meeting is supposed to be quick, right? Like 15 minutes. Their stand-up <laughs> meetings were an yes. hour and a half. <laughs> yeah. Hour and a half. And nobody's doing anything, but just reporting on what they're doing. Okay. If you're using project management software of any kind, that stuff is all there. We don't right. all need to stand in a circle right. to figure that out. 
Mm -hmm. So if, if the conversation is happening, I told him this, if the conversation is happening and nobody's helping each other, nobody's jumping in and say, okay, well, I can help you with this. You're stuck there. Let's after this meeting, let's right. There's no action coming out mm -hmm. of this meeting. So they just quit. They just quit doing it all together. Right. And it made a massive difference in their productivity. They're just talking to each other more during an eight hour day more mm -hmm. often. But so how does a decision like that come about? Right. Because in most organizations, you maybe some people have a hunch that probably you know they shouldn't do their stand up for one and a half uh, yeah, hours, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, but then, what's the difference in an organization where somebody can actually zoom out and say like, "Hey, do we still need to do this?" And you know, a week or two weeks after, it's actually okay. No, we're not going to do it anymore. Um, wh how? how do companies go about that or how do employees go about that like how do you how do you ignite change like that that varies widely as well mm -hmm. there are different flavors of it um sometimes it's a matter of somebody on the team taking it to, if if in other words if the team doesn't have the authority to make that decision mm -hmm. you have to go to somebody else you have to go to a product owner you have right. to go to um whoever and make the case say look we're doing this and it sucks and it's not getting us what we want And it's obvious that you're frustrated. We're frustrated. Right. The CEO is frustrated. <laughs> yeah, right. right. Everybody else, nobody's getting what they want here. We really want to try something different for at least just for the next two weeks. So it's seeking this honest conversation. These yeah, but somebody, somebody has to have the courage right. to speak up and say that. And that's right. not an easy thing. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, I, I fully recognize that it is not an easy thing especially in an organization that's very command and control centered yeah but again you have to communicate to that person whoever needs to hear it mm -hmm. that this is not getting you what you want mm -hmm. that's how they need to hear it because until they hear it that way you're going to get this like oh they're just disgruntled employees or they're pushing back or, or they want to gold plate everything or whatever it is right, right. you can hear any variation of, of those things um, and you have to be willing to be the odd man out in the room and say yeah. something that's unpopular. Yeah. And that's also, like, I find there are ways to actually say it, you know, in a way where you're not attacking anyone. Like, of course. Of fault, right? Oh, yeah, like yeah. This. You have to. I, I say this all the time. You have to be calm. Yeah. Right. Your demeanor has to be calm. You have to be even killed. You need to keep emotion out of the conversation completely. The Stating minute. The facts. That's right. The minute you lose your temper, the minute you become emotional, the minute you say, you know, this thing that you're telling us to do, you cannot go there. You have to, mm -hmm. I always say, you have to be calm in the face of every storm. Yeah. <laughs> right. No matter how you feel inside, you've got to keep, like you just said, you got to stick to the facts. You got to stick to what's happening and say, look, we'd really like to try something else. Mm -hmm. The minute you lose your temper, you're done. That's the other thing, right? Um, what, what I sometimes see inside companies is there's, The, uh, there's always a lot of problems, right? But if you come with an actual solution that is thought out and actually makes you know makes sense, that right. at least to try, that also helps, right? That's Make right. a request with a thought out solution as well in the end, probably. Yeah, nobody. You can't just go and say, "And this is this shit. It's not working." You know, it's 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 a mess. It's a you you can't just complain, right? I, I was on a podcast a couple of months ago, and that was my mm -hmm. big thing: like, stop complaining, do something. Yeah. yeah. All right. Part come of the with solution. a solution. Come with right. a come with a suggestion. Come with let's we were we, we're talking to the team. Maybe we'll try this, this, and this. Okay. Mm -hmm. Come with come with something, but don't just don't just come to complain. No one yeah. cares. Yeah, I like this. Uh, uh, don't be don't be uh, uh, part of the problem. Be part of the solution. Yeah, kind yeah. of thing, right? Um, and and so so we talked about kind of the product backlog. And then we talked about maybe some daily processes. Are there some other things where um, there are red flags that you see? Hmm. I mean, the biggest one is, is what I keep coming back to is that, is that nobody questions this work to the degree mm -hmm. that, it, that it should be. There, there's a lot of... There's a lot of order taking um, that happens, and I think it happens for a couple of reasons. Number one, because everybody is is overloaded, right? They have their heads down yeah. just trying to get done what's totally. in front of them. There isn't a whole lot of time to, to zoom out and say, all right, wait a minute, is this worth doing? 
The other thing is, is there's this sort of underlying assumption I see all the time that if you're doing UX or design work in particular, that it has to take this amount of time. Right. I cannot tell you how many times I've seen UX folks or designers throw up their hands and say, well, we, we can't do anything. We can't right. do anything. Why can't I gonna say, why, why can't you do anything? Well, because we need two weeks of user research and they just absolutely will not agree to it. And I say, okay, will they agree to eight hours? Yeah. And I get blank stares. All right. Mm -hmm. it, it, just because you're not getting exactly what you asked for doesn't mean you shouldn't do anything. Right. right. <laughs> and often the ask is too big to begin with mm -hmm. because here's what happens. If you ask for eight hours, okay, you say, I just, I just want eight hours to do some research, whatever that looks like, whether it's actually interfacing with users or not, I don't care. If you ask for eight hours and you get it, there's a really solid chance that you'll uncover something within that time yeah. that in a lot of cases will buy you more time. Mm -hmm. Because when you bring it to people, when you bring that yeah, problem that you've point. uncovered to people, they go, wow, okay, we had no idea that was happening. Mm -hmm. like I've seen that more times than I can count. <laughs> but if your ask is like this, it's an instant no. Everybody's stressed. Everybody's busy. Everybody's you know, project right. managers in particular have an eye on schedule, budget, schedule, budget, schedule, budget. Why? Because there's a sword hanging over their heads mm -hmm. about meeting those goals. It's the only thing they care about. Yeah. Because they're they're supposed to, right? So on the on the like on the top of your head, what are some good questions to zoom out? You know, what are what are some questions I can ask myself mm -hmm. e, um, if something's going the wrong way or if a project, you know, whether that's a project or in general, how the team works, what kind of questions can I ask myself? It's I mean, everything starts with why. Said, mm. Why is this happening? What, whatever, like you make, you start and you make a list, mm. right? Here are all the screwed up things that are going on right now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right? Seriously. I mean, it's, yeah, it's sure. not more, it isn't any more complicated than that. Here's what's happening. And you look at each one of those things and number one, and, and you look at it a couple of ways. Number one for each thing, how bad is this? And how often is it happening? Mm -hmm. All right. The combination is it's really bad. It's screwing up our timelines. We're delivering things that are buggy and don't work well, or right. we're, we're, we're absolutely not delivering half of what we promise, mm -hmm. whatever it is. And that happens consistently week after week, after week, after week, mm -hmm. that's something you need to address. The next thing you ask is why is that happening? Mm -hmm. And, yeah. and just like I talk about this uh, in the talk, just like when you interrogate a problem, you use um, Toyota's version of the five whys, right? You ask mm -hmm. why at least five times. Yeah. This is the same thing because you have to get to the root cause of why that's going on, right? Why is there so much miscommunication? Why um, when, when UX or design, UI designer does something a certain way and then a week later, when we look at the, the prototype or the build in, in dev, it looks completely different. Right? Why is there this gulf in understanding? Or mm -hmm. why, when we finally show something to stakeholders, do they do they look at it and go, okay, that's right. not what I imagined when I wrote the requirements. Mm -hmm. Why is that happening? Where is that gap coming from? What's causing it? Okay, It's not enough to address the fact that there's a disconnect. You got to figure out what the root cause is. And sometimes the root cause is really poor communication. Mm -hmm. Right. I talk a lot about jargon and terminology, for example. Mm -hmm. Um, the fact that a lot of the things that, that are second nature to us and every person, every profession is guilty of this, right? When you talk about your own work, you talk about it in a way that's natural to you mm -hmm. and you assume everybody knows what you're talking about. And a lot right. of times in meetings, people aren't willing to really admit that they don't know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. So you walk out of a session, you think you have agreement and in reality, you have nothing of the sort. <laughs> yeah, totally. totally. It's, right. it's interesting because, um, uh, boss, um, Pierce from uh, from Skyscanner, who was um, on our first episode this season, um, he he kind of mentioned that um, what what he tries to do in his team is to instill the notion that stakeholders, whatever level, um, are to be treated just like the user itself as well. Amen. And and Amen. and I really like it actually. Yeah. Amen. It's absolutely true. It's, I mean, I couldn't have said it better myself. That's absolutely true. And, and those of you who've seen my, my rants on social media, I mean, I talk about that as well. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing, right? Yeah. These people matter every bit as much as the users matter. Right. Yeah, you actually had one around terminology, right? It's great in the UX. There's like 
<laughs> all these terms and you know the people that are actually practicing you might care a lot about these terms and the differences between these terms but the people you're talking to your your managers or even the ceo he doesn't right he doesn't know and he doesn't care <laughs> right yeah okay he doesn't care i i say this all the time i know all those big words mm -hmm. i don't ever use them right yeah all right i i, I avoid saying the word when i'm with a client I avoid saying the word UX if I can get away with it. Mm -hmm. All I'm talking about is, is what our problems are, what our opportunities are, what our goals are, what we're trying to achieve, and what we hope is going to happen after this two weeks is up or, or two mm -hmm. months or three months or you know two years or whatever it is. What are we gunning for here and how are we going to get it? Yeah. Do you, you, you have this, um, uh, this, this quote that I saw somewhere where you say great ux isn't the result of what you do with your hands it's the result of how you use what's between your ears hmm, what Amen. could that be um what so if you if you say that what's the i guess what's the right mindset today to to have what are some what are some traits that are helpful you know or what are some um yeah what's the right mindset I, I think it's 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 largely it, it's it's what it sounds like. Okay, I, I think that we have an unbelievable over reliance on on tools, mm -hmm. on software, on patterns, on libraries, on templates, yeah. um, on on technology in general. Right, the first place that everybody looks to solve a problem is with an artifact of some type, a tool of some yeah. type. Okay. And it's the wrong place to look. You can have a million tools at your disposal. Yeah. If, if what you think about up here and how you apply that tool and what you apply it to and why you use something in a certain circumstance, if that part is unsound, yeah. you're going to fail. Okay. I grew up building houses. Mm -hmm. I had contracting companies on both sides of my family. So mm -hmm. I grew up working on cars and, and building houses. So here's the thing, like, let's take cars for an example. When something is wrong with a car, it is almost never just one cause and it's obvious. It's always a matter of there could, it's probably one of these three things, but I don't know which one it is. Mm -hmm. If you just pick up some tools and start doing things, you're not necessarily going to figure out what it is, right? You have to think about what's happening, why is it happening, and which right. one of these things do I do first and why do I do it first, right? To eliminate the other variables. Mm -hmm. This is no different. You know, building a house is no different. There are there are any number of ways to put up a wall. These guys a lot of times use nail guns, right? And that's common. Now everybody uses these these air powered mm -hmm. nail guns. Yep. The problem is if you're not paying attention and you're not careful and you're using it for everything, including you know very soft or very brittle wood, <laughs> you put nails through stuff and the wood splinters. Right. Okay. So what happens is later on you have a problem right? That wall shakes. Or if you're not paying attention to the distance between, if you do it by hand, if you think about where's this nail going, what's it going into? Let me make sure I'm hitting the right spot. If you mark things with a pencil quickly before you do it, for example, you get a different result. That's all thinking. Mm -hmm. So tools are great. Frameworks are, are great. Pattern libraries are great, but we take these things out of the box and we apply them as if they're going to save the world. They're yeah. not. Okay, and responsive I grids, all this automatic stuff. Right. That's like, you know, AI. AI is going to save the world. Let me tell you something. AI is 10 years away from saving anything. Right. And it's and I think it actually has to do with what you mentioned before. You know, people are they have too much work on their hands, uh, yes. too tight deadlines, and then there's no time for thinking, right? Yes. There's no time to actually sit down and come up with uh, original solutions. So you are quickly Googling something, right? Um, to kind of yeah. make it work. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, but the other thing is, and I totally agree with that. I think everybody is overworked. Mm -hmm. I've never met a, a single person or a team that wasn't grossly overworked. Mm -hmm. However, there's always 15 minutes, mm -hmm. always, always, always before you do something to just like, quit for 15 minutes and mm -hmm. think about it. All right. For me, I have to get a pen in my hand and I have mm -hmm. to, I have to write on paper or I have to do it on a whiteboard because I have to forcibly remove myself from this device. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. In order to, in order to sort of get past it. And it's, uh -huh. sometimes it's just, it could be five minutes. It could be 10 minutes. It could be whatever. 
but you have to do it. It changes the way you think. And mm -hmm. what you find is that your knee jerk reaction changes. You say, well, all right, instead of doing that, what I think I'm going to do instead is I'm going to do this smaller piece and let's see what happens, right? I'm going to spend yeah. a half hour doing this and let's see where it goes. Mm -hmm. And if it works, then I'll keep going down that path. There's always time for that. The problem is we don't allow ourselves yeah, totally. um, that because we're convinced we don't have the time. And it's not true. It's actually, I've seen um, one colleague, not, not here at Testing Time, but at another company. I really like that. So he, before he sat down and actually did a task, he had like a set of questions where he was basically asking himself, okay, so why am I doing this, right? What, yeah. what, what do I want to um, accomplish, right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um, and who is the user and stuff like that. So like four, four or five things. And he said in these like 10 minutes, similar to what you described actually, in these 10 minutes, he clarified and saved so much work afterwards. Exactly. Um, and that's kind of part of his habit. So maybe that's something that people can take up. I like that. I totally agree with that. That 15 minutes can save you two weeks. Yeah. Yeah. All right. And, and a tremendous amount of headache mm -hmm. when you go down a path and it doesn't work. Yeah. Right. Or it's difficult for, for development to, to pull off, or there's just constant, you know, walls that you run into with technology or whatever the case may be. Right. May save you an extraordinary amount of headache. Okay, also because stress. you also because you have clarity now, right? Because you actually yeah. Yeah. kind of played it through on some paper. Um yep. cool. So um you talked a bit about before on all the stuff you did. I would also like to know, I'm sure you have some um failures that you had on your path on your path as well. Um like no, we all do. Never. Oh, right. Um if 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 you can mention one, um, let's say let's call it your 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 favorite failure, what mm -hmm. would that be and and why? What have you learned from it? There's one that always comes back to me, and this was early on in my career. Um, and, and I always say that one of, one of the best things that could ever happen to you in your career is to have your nose broken, and to have it happen more than once. Because every time that happens, you learn from it. You realize it didn't kill you. You realize you're still here. You realize you get to go on. And um, I like to say you either win or you learn. Okay. There's no such thing as, as failure. Um, so here's what happened. Look, I don't try to condense this. I got my first big client. This is when I had just started my own firm. Okay. This is back in the late nineties. I want to say very big deal, right? This is more money than I had ever seen at any point in my life <laughs> in a single contract. <laughs> yeah. So I really want to impress these people because they're hiring me. I'm the expert, right? right? So immediately, I'm, I'm very much on a high horse. I'm very self-righteous. And I, 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 everything they're showing me, I'm, in my mind, I'm going, it's terrible. It's so bad. It's horrible. Like, what the heck? I'm like, so I'm going to teach these people, right? Uh -huh. So I spend two weeks. It was about two weeks, I think, writing up this proposal, okay, in, in tremendous detail. This is like a 40-page <laughs> proposal and I'm yeah. and I'm just picking apart everything and I'm going and, and it all feels I'm like yeah they're gonna think and part of this in my mind if I'm honest at this point in my life part of this is I'm saying to myself they're gonna this is really gonna impress them right they're gonna really be impressed mm -hmm. so I give it to him I go it's a presentation right and there are uh, board members in the room like high-powered executives in the room who are who have big bets riding on this kid mm -hmm. And I, I do my thing and I'm going and I'm going, I'm going and I'm watching the faces in the room and the faces in the room are like this <laughs> and like this. That and I'm, must be I'm a great feeling. Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> fantastic. It does wonders for your self-esteem. Uh -huh. I'm sweating, I'm hot. I'm like, and I'm dying. I am literally, I can feel myself dying. So finally I shut up and one of the, the guys on the board goes, there is not one piece of what you just talked about that has anything to do with what we do or what our goals are Ouch. as an organization. And I went, <laughs> wow, I, wow. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. And here's the thing. He was right because here's what I didn't do. I was very self-righteous and I was very quick to point out all my expertise and I was very quick to point yeah. out everything that was wrong and everything that they were screwing up. 
-hmm. I did not once ask any of those people anything substantive about <laughs> what they, what, why they did what they did, right. why people came to them, why they had a successful business for 20 years, um, why they were gaining ground in certain markets, right? What struggles they were dealing with, what they expected to accomplish at the end of this. I just, I, it was about me. I made yeah. it all about me <laughs> and not about them. Okay. So I had to fall on my sword and say, I am, I'm, I, all I can do is apologize. There was yeah. a lot of digging that should have been done here and I did not do it. Um, and I lost the money. I mean, I lost the contract. They, they mm -hmm. fired me. Um, and it was brutal. Okay. I, I lived with that for weeks afterwards, oh, probably, sounds... probably months afterwards, if I'm being honest. Probably. Yeah. It was, I was crushed. But, but this is a, but this is a, I never oh, made that okay. mistake again. All right. I never made that mistake again. <laughs> yeah. Never. How, how, how did you say before? Um, everything is either, um, you win or you learn. You win or you learn. I like that. That's a right. Lot. And but I this learned. Is a, <laughs> this is a, and you learned. <laughs> yes, the hard way though, but that's good. Um, but so did you, um, did you encounter that as an issue? um across the board in your consulting afterwards that the ego comes in the way often like in the in the ux field or or is that yeah, yeah you're and here, here's the other thing right people ask me a lot about imposter syndrome yeah. um i get asked that question a lot and here's what i think i think everybody has it i have mm -hmm. it I've had it my entire life um and it doesn't get better as you get older it's always there to some degree the difference in youth okay for me is is that i was i mean i was wildly insecure. I was, for whatever reason, it's a weird combination of things, right? I was brave enough mm -hmm. to start my own company and I started other things as well. Like I started a couple magazines, a, a book publishing company at a record mm -hmm. label for a while. So in, in one respect, I was just not fearless, but I was totally willing to dive into all these things. Mm -hmm. At the same time, I was wildly insecure and, mm -hmm. and, and, and filled with self-doubt. So there was this impetus to prove my worth at every conceivable opportunity, mm -hmm. right? To, to be like, you know, like, no, I, like I know what I'm talking about. And that's what all this stuff is. Mm -hmm. You're trying to convince other people that you know what you're doing. And while you're right. doing that, you're not paying attention to the situation. You're not paying attention to what really needs to be done. So did I struggle with that afterwards? Yes. Um, I never erred on, on the side of having it be all about me after that, that instance. But it's something I recognized in myself and it's something I consciously started to try to counteract, yeah. right? To, to check that tendency to want to preach mm -hmm. and say, well, wait a minute, be quiet, listen, mm -hmm. listen more than you talk, especially in prospect meetings, right? Yeah. And I started, got in the habit of taking a ton of notes, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, recording things so I could listen to it later. What are people actually saying? Trying to, in some cases, you're reading between the lines, right? What's what's really happening here? Yep. And then asking more questions. That's the part, and right? I, yep. I found that the more questions I asked, with even in the even in the prospecting stage when people are thinking about hiring me, if I treated every conversation like a working session, like mm -hmm. we're working to figure out what's really going on here, right? The more successful I got. Okay, the better clients I got, um, the more long-term work I got. Um, the less I had to worry about money. <laughs> yes. I mean, lots of things came from that. And it's, it really is all about moving yourself out of the way and being willing to be wrong, being willing mm -hmm. to learn. Yeah. You know, it's this, I mean, what I felt as well is whenever you ask questions, people see that you are actually um, interested, right? They care. And and if you ask an intelligent question in terms of you can only ask a good question if you really know um, what they're talking about, or at least you you know what you don't know yet, right? Yeah, but if you yeah. are coming out with the that you already know everything, and totally, I think that's kind of um, how do you call this uh, kind of the, the arrogance of youth. Yes. Um, a lot of people have that in the beginning. You know, you you think you know everything until you realize that you don't know anything. And I um, think that, and I think what that comes yeah. from is fear. It's fear yeah. that you don't know everything. So you're, you're overcompensating, uh, yeah. <laughs> trying mm -hmm. to convince everybody right. that you do. Uh -huh. And, and um, I mean, just like you, you get asked in, in plenty of circumstances, right? If you, from your day-to-day -day work, you will constantly be asked for things or, or to weigh in on things or pr to propose solutions to things mm -hmm. where you don't know enough about the, the issue or the solution in the first place. And you will be very tempted to give an answer. Yeah. And the best thing to do is to say, look, we've only been talking for three minutes. Yeah. 
I don't know nearly enough <laughs> yep. to give you an opinion on that. We need, we need to learn more. And it's the same with prospective clients. Mm -hmm. It's the same with people inside your organization on your own team. Um, someone in management who's asking you, you know, or how are we going to do this, 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 and this? If the answer is, I don't know yet, that's what you say. Yeah. Okay. And you have to be honest about that because doing otherwise will paint you into a corner very, very quickly. Yeah. Because people take what you said in the moment then as, okay, this person said, right? <laughs> right. right. Yeah. Exactly. And that's where right. you are from that point yeah. forward. Well, exactly. So-and-so said this was going to work. Right. What so it's also here about courage, right? To actually say, I don't yes. know, because it's okay yes. to not know. Yes. Yeah. Um, well, it's, it's already 45 minutes. We uh, breeze through that. Um, cool. But let me ask you a few um, questions before we go to the uh, audience questions. Sure. Um, so if you would have to say kind of, of all everything that we talked about in the last 45 minutes, or maybe even we can expand that to to the stuff that you teach. What would you? What is like one thing that people should take away that will have a big impact on their professional lives, maybe even their private lives? Something that you saw that is an inhibitor in many um, um, individuals in the workplace. I think there's two things, all right, and, and, and there are the two things I come back to quite often. Number one, I think everybody in every position, you have to let go of this idea that you have to be fearless. Okay. Mm -hmm. There's no such thing. You are never going to be 100% confident. There is never going to be a right time to do whatever. The planets are not going to align for you. And you're suddenly going to feel like, okay, now's the time when I right. do my thing. <laughs> All the people I've met who are ridiculously successful, even in other fields, right? I've, I've had the privilege of meeting musicians, actors, people in very high positions, mm -hmm. all of them will tell you that at every point, every time they did something that was really important to their growth, to their career, mm -hmm. they were feeling more fear than they knew what to do with. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the first part is you have to accept that imposter yeah. syndrome, fear, call it what you want. You have to accept it, live with it and do it anyway. Mm -hmm. Okay. You have to ask the question anyway, you have to take the step anyway, right? You have to take it upon yourself to do, you know, a couple hours of research, even if everybody's saying you can't do that, mm -hmm. you have to, you have to move. You have to, you have to take step, that step into forward. the fear. Yeah. Yes. Embrace it. Pit, like my friend Melanie always says, like imposter syndrome. Okay. Mm -hmm. It can sit in the car. It can sit in the passenger seat, but it has to sit there and behave. And it's not allowed to put its hands on the wheels. Yeah. Right. Yeah. To drive. Right. Um, that's the first thing. The, the second thing is I think personally, I feel like the most important trait you can have, and I think I said this on the User Defenders podcast, the most important trait you can have is resilience. Mm -hmm. Okay. The ability to, to bounce back, come back. Because in your career, in life, in every aspect of everything you do, you are going to get knocked down. Okay. You're going to have stuff come at you that you're not ready for. You're going to have things that are going to take the wind out of your sails. All right. Mm -hmm. It's, it's just natural in any number of ways, large and small, you have to accept that as reality. And you also have to realize that it does not ever have to stop you. Mm -hmm. I said this to somebody a couple of weeks ago, as long as I've been doing this, the only thing that has ever had the potential to stop me is me. Mm -hmm. That's the truth. Mm -hmm. All right. And, and like everybody, I've been through some, some tough stuff as well, personally and professionally is it's all about you yeah. <laughs> and how you, and how you deal with it. You have to keep going, you know, and that's, that's part of being calm as well. When someone if you're having a conversation with a stakeholder and they're getting heated, right. Cause they're frustrated and they don't understand why any of this gold plated UX stuff really matters. That's fine. Let them get upset. You have to take that right? Mm -hmm. You have to let it hit you and let it bounce off and you stay calm and you, and you focus on, okay, what can I do here? What does this person really need? What can I say to them? That's going to communicate in a way that they're going to understand me. That's yeah. resilience. That's resilience. You have to keep coming back. I like that. One thing, one thing I think I helps there a lot is also because in the moment you're kind of overwhelmed, right? Yes. And because the ego kind of thinks it's, it's, um, it's forever, you know, this is a state and it's going to be like this forever, but realize yeah, yeah. that it's a momentary, like emotional, um, 
uh, outburst or something like that that goes on inside you and that it's okay and you know and you can't just get up and and continue i think right. helps a lot it's not permanent well it's biology too i mean your your, your right. brain your amygdala and your brain literally thinks you're under attack Right. And, and everything in your body and your mind responds appropriately. Like, okay, right. let's go. Right. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. You have to consciously work to counteract that. Right. Okay. So the two tips from uh, Joe um, are first. Um, what's Feel the, first? the fear. Feel the fear. Two tips. Feel the fear. Do it anyway. Nice. I like and that. And the second thing is practice resilience. Okay. You can and will come back from everything that comes your way. You can, I promise you. All right. I, I like that. Very encouraging words. So if you, um, whether it's about these topics or, or in general, are there some um, resources um, besides your own courses, obviously? Um, mm -hmm. You can find them on Udemy, right? Your courses. Yeah, uh, Udemy, Udemy.com, uh, yeah. of course. You can, I have also have courses on my own platform, learn.givegoodux dot com yeah. um you know youtube social media my own website givegoodux.com um etc cetera, etc cetera. so it's it's all out there <laughs> okay good and what other what are the resources um do you can can you recommend some books that you gift often to people or oh, yeah yeah what what would there you are several <laughs> there are several um number one anything alan cooper has ever written is well worth your time even the older books like uh, The Inmates Are Running the Asylum or mm. About Face. Um, and I think there is a newer edition of, it, of About Face, but even the ones that, have, that are dated a little bit, the conceptual ideas there are solid all day long. Mm -hmm. Okay. Don Norman, of course. Okay. <laughs> excellent, excellent, excellent books. Um, I think that one of the best books I've ever read in my life on user research is Erica Hall's um, just enough research. And she just released mm -hmm. a new expanded edition of it, um, which looks to be fantastic. It's a tremendous book. It's an easy read. It's simple. It's quick. It's, it's just, it's brilliant. Okay. And she does the same thing that, that I talk about a lot, which is let's get away from this perfect world stuff. Right. Here's what really needs to happen in situations mm -hmm. where the world doesn't bend to our will. Mm -hmm. Here's what you can do. All right. She is as clear eyed as they come. And I love everything she does. Um, there's a book called universal principles of design that I think is one of the best resources on design mm -hmm. principles ever created. And I, I've probably said this before, but my position is the way I learned design is essentially UX. It's all about people. It's all about why they respond the way they do. It's about human behavior, cognitive mm -hmm. psychology. And this book, even though it's about visual design principles, it touches all that stuff. It's, it's, it's the core of what drives great visual design of any kind. Mm -hmm. All right. So I think that's an excellent book. And there, there are probably a lot more, but those are always the ones that come to the top for me. Perfect. Good. So then let's take a little segue and let's go into the um, Q&A question. So there is an upvote feature. So let me quickly browse through it, but I'm starting with the um, first one that got six votes. My boss um, is keep changing the requirements like every day. He say he says remove this field, flow our business. Uh, this field flow our business doesn't need it. And in the start of wireframing, he agreed to the fields flow. Now it leads to the UX um, not being good. Um, how should I handle this? You know, changing requirements and if he's if he's changing his mind, and this goes with anybody, okay. If 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 that person is changing their mind daily, weekly, whatever. That is a sure sign that they're grasping at stuff, okay? He doesn't know what's going to work. That's fear at work. That's, mm -hmm. okay, well, let's do this. And then he goes online on Google and he reads an article about something. He goes, oh, wait, 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 okay, forget that. Let's sure. do this instead. Uh -huh. That's what that is. I've seen it a hundred times. So what you have to do in that situation is you have to ask that person, look, can I talk to you for 15 minutes about this? Right. And, and whether that needs to be a formal meeting or an offhand conversation, I don't care what it is, but you need to have a face to face conversation with this person. And you need to say, look, I feel like we, we sort of keep changing direction, which is fine. But I think maybe the conversation we're not having is what are you hoping will happen mm -hmm. at the end of this? 
right? When we get, when, when we launch this, whatever it is, what needs to happen for you f- to feel confident, to feel secure, to feel like this was a success, that this was worth doing in the first mm-hmm. place. You want him to tell you what he wants. Forget about what the process should be or what should be on the screen. Press him for what he wants, okay? Mm-hmm. What he wants to happen or what he's a, or what he's concerned about. Say, look, what are you worried won't happen if we launch yep. this? That's the conversation you need to have, all right? And then from that, you say, well, okay, of the things that we've tried so far, the things that we've talked about, I think we should try this one thing because I think that's going to get you closer to where you want. Let's do this, look at it, see what happens, and then we'll talk about all the other stuff, Mm -hmm. right? Because chances are there's one or two things that are going to get you closer to that goal. The rest of it is just just fear and throwing darts and hoping to hit something. But that's not going to change until you have that conversation with him. Thank you. Uh, we go on to uh, Kieran. What are the core components to the research process you would always keep if time is a factor slash someone does restrict the amount of time for it? Yeah, which is how about always? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> show me show me a perfect, you know, thorough user research um, part of any project and I'll, I'll pay you a million dollars right now. Um, time is always a factor. So you're looking to get to the truth. The first question is, do we have access to users or don't we? All right. If the answer is yes, then you figure out a reasonable time over the target. Again, if they're not willing to give you a week or even two days or, or whatever, you have to compress your ask. You have to change what you're asking for. Hmm. All right. That's, that's option a. So you say, all right, can just, I need half a day to talk to users. I need a day to talk to users, right? How many interviews can you cram into eight hours? Make them quick, make them 20 minute sessions and and that's it. That's what you ask for. Or if the answer to that is no, and you you have access to users, find a way to do it anyway, okay? No one has to know that those conversations took Mm -hmm. place as long as you have permission to talk to those people, of course. Now, if you don't have access to users, fine. You got to find another way. Okay. You got to do like, for instance, empathy mapping exercises, situation mapping exercises. I wrote a blog post about this quite a while back um, on givegoodux.com. They're great exercises. At the very least, they put everybody, and you do this with the team, they put everybody in the mindset of what does this person want and what's it, what's, what are, what's what we're delivering going to get them and how's it benefit us? That is, in and of itself is beneficial. You can spend four hours on Google looking for things that people complain about, Mm -hmm. all right? That's worth something as well. The point is you have to do something. Find the time to do something and you do not always have to ask permission to do it, okay? If you're just doing desk research, Google research, social media research, no one has to sanction that. Carve an hour out of your day and do it, okay? So those are, my my advice always falls along those lines. Mm -hmm. Um, Dima is asking, is it worth to attach KPI metrics to value definition? So, I mean, I guess I'm not sure if she's referring to the prioritization that we mentioned before on what you should actually do in the backlog or, I mean, when, when sure. do KPIs actually come into, come into play for you? When, when does it actually make sense and when is it when, counterproductive? Well, number one, when, when it doesn't, well, I want to say this, when people care about them. Okay. Mm. When, when the people making the decisions, when the people making the money decisions, when people who are, who are saying, yeah, we are going to spend that much time on this, or we're not going to spend that much time on this. Um, when those people care about it, because you can measure KPIs all day long. If no one ever looks at them, it's pointless. Mm. Okay. It's pointless. I've, and I've, I say that because I've walked into plenty of organizations where, where the teams themselves, right. And the product owners in some cases are measuring everything and they've got a ton of data and it's all very good and very valuable but no one above them gives a shit right. okay it doesn't matter it doesn't matter they're not they can't use it for any basis for decision making because no one's willing to even look at the data <laughs> if that's happening it's pointless um in terms of what's the question when should they be used um is it worth off. to attach kpi metrics yeah it is it is if i'm gonna, I'm gonna put two caveats to this 
It is if number one, the right people care about those metrics, as I said, and number two, if those metrics are clear, simple, easily defined. If I have to read an entire sheet of paper to understand what it is, then no. no. Yeah. Okay. I can't tell you in data rich environments, how many times I've seen KPIs or, or, or data based, you know, evidence based decisions be presented and you're expecting someone to sit for a half hour and hear this. Or you're expecting somebody to read four pages to understand what's going on or look at this convoluted chart that's very hard to understand. It's got to be dead simple because no one has time. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if you can't present it simply, if it's not hugely compelling, if it's not the kind of metric that makes people go, oh my God, we need to either, we need to take advantage of that or we need to do something yeah. about that. If it doesn't evoke either one of those responses, it's not worth doing. Thanks. Uh, we have maybe time for another two uh, questions. Cool. Leon asks, um, Joe, what do you reply to a client who says, we already did market research and we already know what to do and we just need someone to do it? Well, it's a matter of qualifying that. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, you have to say, all right, fine. What was, the mar what was that market research? Share mm -hmm. it with me so that I know what you learned so that I know um, what you think is going to happen. In other words, you have to see it. Yeah. So you're not asking, you're not, you're not arguing with them. You're not saying, well, I know better. You, the way you position it is great. That's awesome. That'll inform the work that I do to make sure that we're on the same page to make sure that I'm, you know, in line with, with your goals and your needs. So can you please share that with me? Nine times out of 10, they will. That's all you say. Mm -hmm. All right. And you look at it, you get it. And you see what it says. If there's validity in there, if they've got good representative samples and it's not sort of these leading questions that most marketing surveys use, if, it, you know, if it's not garbage, then fine. But nine times out of 10, you'll sort of see the holes in that stuff. Mm -hmm. And then you go back to them and say, okay, I got all this stuff and it feels to me like your goal is A, B, C. Is that accurate? All right. If they say yes, then or no, then you either speak to the way that that research supports those goals, mm -hmm. right? What they're asking you to do on the screen either supports those goals um, or doesn't, right? If, especially if they're giving orders. Well, I want it to be like this and work like this and do this. It gives you the opportunity to say, well, I mean, what I'm hearing is that you want this, right? But in my experience, none of this stuff is going to get you there. Mm -hmm. Here's what's probably going to happen instead. So, Number one, you have to see it. Until you can actually see what the hell they're talking about, you don't have a prayer. Um, I had an instance like that where uh, I was working with a, a large organization. They're like, no, that's it. That's been tested. It's been tested. It's been tested. We did, we did user testing <laughs> right. with that. And I said, I said, okay, what was the, how many people, you know, what was the sample size? What was that thing like? Well, six people. Six. Were those actual users or were they in, internal folks? This is a consumer facing product. Mm -hmm. Well, they were just, they were people here. Okay. <laughs> and I, and what I say in that instance is, especially when the person is pushing, look, at the end of the day, it's your decision. It's your money. It's, yeah. it's your call to make. I'm a consultant. Right. It, it doesn't affect my life one way or the other. <laughs> you know, I get to leave in, right. in, in two weeks. But what I think is that you're going you're gonna to make decisions based on a series of false clues. And I think that you're not going to get what you're after and, and you're mm -hmm. going to be frustrated. Right. Six people is not enough to account for just idiosyncrasies in human behavior. And it's also not people who use the product every day. Yeah. So you're, our perspective inside these walls is biased. Mm -hmm. All right. That's a given. So again, you, we can do this, but I don't think it's going to get what you want. Yeah. You have to at least go on record saying that. And there are some times when you have to give in. Okay. There, there's only so long you can bang your head up against the wall yeah. before you say, you know what? This just has to be done. And so I can move right. past it. Right. Or you say, or you say, you know what, that's how I'm doing things. I'm walking away. You can always say that too, right? Absolutely. Um, if you have Absolutely. your principles and you're like, yeah, you can say, look, way. I think this is going to hurt you and I cannot in good conscience do it right. because you're going to be really angry and you're going to be really angry with me Right. <laughs> right. once it's done. And that's going to suck for both of us. Yeah. And then you emotional pain is shared. Exactly. Clients, especially. And I, I forgot this yeah. is sort of a client question. I'm going to say this and then I'll, I'll let it go. You should be willing to walk away. Okay. If yeah. you think they're heading into danger, 
you should walk away. It's the hardest thing to do when you work for yourself because you don't want to give up the money. Right. But I promise you, the fallout from that will hurt you more. If you go down mm -hmm. that path and it doesn't work, mm -hmm. you're still the guy who made it happen. Right. Or, or girl, or, you know, that's a good point. Mm -hmm. You, it's, it's not worth it. The fallout from yeah. that will last a very long time and they will bitch about you to every single person they come in contact with. Right. Walk away if you have to. Well, since everybody likes your advice so much, we do two more questions. Okay. Yep. So, no um, if you got the time, obviously. Yeah, I'm, I'm as long Good. as you want me. All right, perfect. So um, there is a question um, from Walter Yang and Marie Williams that go into a similar direction. Um, Marie asks, do you have tips for collaborating with developers that are nine plus hours away to help get common understanding and have conversations around things that don't make sense or work technically? And Walter asks something similar. How would you approach working with only developers overseas in an agile method? I've been noticing there's a great decrease in time efficiency um, and so forth. So um, yeah, what's kind of your take on that, on, on having developers remote and then um, going through the agile so yeah, it sounds like in both it. in both cases there's a there's a significant time difference. Is that right? Probably. I'm not sure in Walter's case, but definitely in Maggie's case, yes. Okay. Um, well, I mean, you have to find you have to find common ground, and you have to find a good way to check in with each other, and and it, and it has to be often. Okay. Mm -hmm. Here, here's the problem I see in those situations, and a lot of the companies I work with have outsourced teams. One mm -hmm. of the ways this never works is we, we do the thing where we say, okay, we're gonna have a regular check-in once a week, okay? Or even twice a week. Let, let's just say, right? It, it, that's usually what I see. A lot of times it's once or twice a week. We're gonna check in with the outsource team. Right. Here's reality. That needs to happen every day, likely multiple times a day. Hmm. Now, is that easy when a team is remote? No, it isn't. It absolutely isn't. At the very least, you have to set up a situation where, let's say they're overseas and they're and, and while you're sleeping, they're working. Mm -hmm. At the very least, you have to set it up where there's a review that happens every morning when you wake up and go in the office or sit down at your desk yeah. where you can see, all right, what's been done? Mm -hmm. Where are we? And if that means that you have to take the time to physically give detailed feedback and ask questions on that and then throw it over the wall, Sometimes that's necessary. If you do that often enough, that mitigates the, 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 or prevents this from becoming like this waterfall thing where now I'm waiting for them, they're waiting for me. Often is the key, right, in any situation. Um, but ideally, you're checking in with those people once a day to review where mm -hmm. are we right now. Forget about midweek or end week or end of the sprint yeah. or middle of the sprint. I don't care, okay? whatever works a couple times a week, every day, if possible, just a quick right. check in 15 minutes. Here's what I just did. Um, what do you think? Are, are there any, you see any red flags here? You see anything that's painting you guys into a corner? Have we done anything that's painting mm -hmm. you into a corner? Is there anything that you're missing um, from us? Anything that, that we're not giving you that you need? You got to just dig through it collaboratively as if you were sitting there working on it together. Yeah. All right, but doing that once a week is not enough. Doing that every two weeks is certainly not enough. It's got to be as often as you can humanly pull it off, right? Because otherwise, you're going to keep running into the situations that that I think both these these folks are describing. Thank often. you. <laughs> um, then let's go to the last question. Lisa Basket asks. Basket asks. I know Lisa. Uh, uh, you know, Lisa. Okay. Yeah. So then you have more context than I do. How do you move an organization stuck in analysis paralysis when you're the only one evangelizing learning by doing? <laughs> hmm. That's never happened to me. I've never seen that happen anywhere <laughs> in, in 29 years. Right. I, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> um, Again, this, and I said this before, that, that analysis paralysis comes from fear. Everyone is afraid to pull the trigger. They're afraid to make a decision and they're afraid that they're wrong. And there are a couple of reasons that they're afraid that they're wrong. Number one, they don't know that they're looking in the right place. They're not convinced that they're looking in the right place. They're not convinced that they're asking the right questions. And in a lot of cases, they may not understand the answers, even if they're getting them. Yeah. Right. Um, and that's, that's just, we don't want to be wrong. So, mm -hmm. 
what you're looking for are ways to minimize that risk for them. Because a lot of times where that, that over analysis comes from is the fact that they're staring down this much work or this much time, right? It's from now until the time we launch this piece. You have to, and this is hard. I make it sound like it's, it's easy. It's not. You have to get them to focus on one piece mm. of this, okay? Not, not all of it. Not, not the be all end all. What does this get us? You got to get them to focus on one piece. All right. Of all the stuff that we're planning to do in the next two weeks, four weeks, six weeks, whatever it is, what matters most? What is the thing? Like if we're a startup, for example, okay, what is the thing that either allows us to live another day <laughs> or is going to kill us dead if we get it wrong? Mm -hmm. Right. What is that thing? Because it's in there somewhere. They just, maybe don't know how to tell you what it is. You got to find out what they're afraid of. Yeah. Bottom line. Yeah. So at the very least you say, look, we've been, we've been talking about this for quite a while now and we're not getting anywhere. So let me take a different tack. What are you afraid is going to go wrong here? Mm. Right. What are you afraid isn't going to happen if we don't get this right? Or right. what part are, or, or you say, what part of this are you most worried about? Mm-hmm. You got to forget the project, forget the, the details, forget the features, forget the, the, even forget the users. All right. What are you worried about here? What is, what is, what are, what are we most concerned about? And let's start there, yeah. <laughs> but you've got to narrow their focus because if you cannot narrow their focus, this will continue, right? They're going to keep looking at everything and anything. You got to find a way to get them to see that, look, of all this stuff that we're talking about, this piece is the piece we need to get right. Because if we screw this up, mm -hmm. everything else doesn't matter, right? There's always something in every project, every product, every organization that is always present. I've never seen an instance um, where it wasn't. So you got to get personal. Yeah. And it's, and it's and it's hard for those people. It's hard for them to do it. And I also, so to, to add to that, the, the one thing that I always find is, I think you mentioned it quickly, it's always something to hide behind, right? Yes. I mean, yes. you you hide behind it because when you're doing it, then you are invariably going to encounter problems, and yeah. and and you it might not work, right? And so yeah. and so you're hiding it with 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 analyzing the issue or the project or what we're going to or planning you over plan and stuff like that. So. What, what I usually like to say also in this case is like not making a decision is a decision. And I think if people sort of understand right. that, you know, it's like it's making a decision not to go forward. It's making a decision to actually yeah. delay the project in a way. Yeah. Yeah. But that's just well, my sense as well. Yeah. And, and I think that's good. I think that's good. And here's something else it made me think of. I mean, the alternate approach is take a piece that's, that's still maybe a big win for them, hmm. but is inconsequential. That's less risky. Yeah. Okay. And execute on it because that, uh, again, that analysis paralysis, that's also fear of making a move, mm -hmm. right? It's fear of like, I, I'm standing on the edge of the cliff and I'm sort of afraid to jump. So see if there's, sorry. thought I'd turn that off. See if there's something that is sort of low risk right? That scares them less yeah. <laughs> that you know, yeah, you can exactly. execute that, you know, you can execute on a reasonable amount of time, even in prototype form, right? And show them, okay, look, here's how we could do this. And that might take their temperatures down a little bit and make them feel like, oh, okay. All right. That's, that, that seems reasonable, right? L look for something that, that can maybe just calm them down, give them something concrete right. that that'll make them stop feeling like this is the, this is a big black hole and they don't know how any of it is going to work. And that's right. one of the reasons I love low fidelity prototyping. And when I say mm -hmm. low fidelity, I don't even just mean wireframes. I mean, sketching on a whiteboard. I mean, yeah. for if having a one hour meeting and saying, okay, what's this piece? What if we prototyped this? And you just, you work it out in real totally. time. You talk about it, you draw it out. And you, again, you're trying to, you're looking for something that's going to make them feel like, okay, this is achievable. Let's right. do that piece. Let's get some progress. And now we feel like, okay, we got through something. Yeah. Because that's the other part. They feel like they're not getting anywhere. And the longer they don't get anywhere, the longer there's no progress, the longer 
there's a gap between what they're thinking and what actually gets built yeah. <laughs> in any way, the fear just grows. The uncertainty grows, the worry grows. And, and when you put something that is actually into the real world, like a sketch, then you have something to actually talk about. And that that's right. relieves some of the fear. Oh, okay. Yeah. So that's how it could look like. So now you have an image in your head versus just okay. like all the data and everything you need to do and scary. Right. And, it, it, yeah. it goes from this to this. Yeah. Yeah. Totally agree. All right. Um, that was uh, 15 minutes more than we planned, but I think it was well worth it. I hope so. Um, thank you very much, uh, Joe, for uh, for your time and your advice. Thank you and, for having um, me. answering all those questions. Uh, one thing for everyone that's still in the audience. So, Joe, can you quickly talk about what you what your presentation will be uh, about at UX Live? Um, kind of what's the title and and one or two bullet points, yeah. um, and also uh, while he's doing that, um, we'll post a. Uh, 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 how do you say coupon code into the chat uh, where you can have 15% off the ticket um, uh, UX live from the 11th until the 13th of November. So what are you going to talk about, Joe? Well, you, you just got a really good preview of a lot of it um, because the, the topic of the talk, the talk is called getting real about UX. Mm -hmm. And it, it is entirely about all these battles that we face every day Um are, are number one, not always the result of what we think they are. In a lot of cases, we are more responsible for that. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times we create a lot of that friction unknowingly, unwittingly. Um, and, and it's about the fact that all this, this great real world, perfect world advice, ordered processes, they sound great on paper. They fail miserably. We're going to talk about why that happens. Yep. And we're going to talk about why that happens. I'm going to talk about what to do instead, all right? How to take an alternate approach how to stop putting yourself in a position where people are sort of automatically trained to not listen to you. Mm -hmm. Like I said, the big takeaway is the, this is more in our hands than we think it is. Okay. Yep. I encounter that everywhere I go. So that's what we're going to talk about. Let's get All real. right. All right. Let's get real yeah, with man. Joe. Thank you very much, Joe. Um, Thank you. It was a pleasure talking to you. And I hope the audience also got uh, a lot of notes out of this and um see you next time the next episode is going to be next week um episode number four uh, we'll send out an email regarding that shortly thank you very much everyone gratitude bye thank you joe cheers bye, -bye.